the MMA Discussion Podcast, episode number nine. I'm here with Adam Carr, our admin, you know him. Adam, say what's up. How's it going, buddy? It's good, man. Good to have you on. I'm excited for this one. We got some uh, we got some good questions. Before that, we're going to go through some topics as well. Uh, talk about the tournament that's going on on the page. First off, first uh, yesterday's matchup announced, Hector Lombard versus Dong Young Kim. Ah, oh, wow. I I was I, I like this fight. This is a great Match fight. Came out of nowhere. Huh? Kind of came out of nowhere. Really? I ca- I was calling for this fight the second uh, Hector beat Jake Shields. I thought that was the next sensible thing to do. I know a lot of people were calling for Lombard versus Brown, but I I thought that this was this was a great fight to make as well. Did uh Brown ca- get get any kind of medical attention? Not that I know of, uh, okay. or that was you know that I read. I mean maybe. I mean, if it was something egregious, we would have heard about it. Yeah, if, I mean, if it was a major injury. Well, but, yeah, I mean, like, all of a sudden, uh, Dong Young Kim is now a knockout striker. That yeah. came out of there. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, well, first of all, I think this fight is insane. I, I was calling for this fight next anyway, so I'm glad to see it happening. Um... Right off the back, for me, I think Hector takes this one. I think it's obvious that Lombard is the uh, better striker, despite being the smaller fighter, I think, in this fight. It's debatable that Hector is also stronger. But Kim has definitely shown some amazing advances in his striking, and you know that yeah. that new, unpredictable style of striking makes makes it to be a really exciting fight now. But uh, I, I pick Hector just because, you know, I think he showed in the Jake Shields fight that his judo is still an, a secondary weapon that he can utilize and that because of his size and strength, it's really hard to take a smaller guy down, especially when he's very strong. Um, it definitely makes for a tough fight for uh, for Dung Young Kim. And so with that in mind, my pick uh, for what I think would be an awesome fight is gotta, I got to go with Lightning. Yeah, and I mean, the thing about uh, Dung Young Kim is he also has a judo base. Yeah. Um, and the thing about Hector Lombard is his, his judo, I can't say for sure, but I would assume it's probably better. Yeah. And also with his very low center of gravity, it's hard, like you said, it's hard to get a, a guy with low center of gravity down, especially if you're trying to upper body grapple with a guy like Hector Lombard. I don't think Kim's grappling is better. I don't think his striking is better. He's since shown the ability to just catch a guy. Mm-hmm. And Lombard, if he doesn't watch his cardio or if he doesn't watch his P's and Q's, he can... You can get caught like anyone else. I mm-hmm. think that's, I really, I mean, it's not good and that's your main way to win is hope you catch a guy, but I'd have to go with the Lombard myself as well. Yeah, just thinking about it uh, for the few hours that we have since it was announced, um, I, I just don't, it's hard to see how DHK really has a... What, what advantages does Kim really have in this fight? Unpredictability, that's about it. Reach, all I can think of is reach. That and reach, yeah. But I mean, you, you see how fast Hector moves. That guy gets inside like you know, like very few can. Um, I think uh, you know, yeah, because of the fact that he's the shorter fighter, and you know, he's able to uh, to probably outmuscle DHK in this fight. I think you know, he'll be able to throw him around. The striking will be definitely exciting to watch because you never know what could happen there. But uh, off the bat, I do give him the advantage. The obvious one, the fact that he's the the more veteranized knockout artist and that his striking has always been there. Um, and he showed a really uh, real good improvement in his pacing in the last fight, his cardio. Yeah, especially in the last fight. You know, he didn't yeah. force he anything. You know, he didn't try to, you know, get... He, he didn't, you know, try to blow his water or yeah, however exactly. you want to say it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if there's anything that DHK could do, it's probably to just... You know, if if he does get inside, clinch up, try not to get thrown around, put him against the cage. If he can take him down, definitely do something with it because if that guy gets back up, he might put his hands. I mean, he almost finished Yushin Okami, and Yushin Okami kind of utilized a game plan where he was trying to keep uh, Lombard grounded, and even even then, near the end of the third round, Lombard almost finished him. That dude can still put you down no matter what. So I'm excited for that fight. It's definitely going to be a good fight. Say that again? They say anything about what event this is at? It's gonna be. It's rumored to be at the uh, the the UFC China card, fight night in China, the Macau card. Main event? Not the main event, um, but all that could make sense as a main event. I'm thinking. I mean, five rounds versus three could also make a big difference. Oh, especially yeah, for sure. I mean, we we, we saw that uh, Lombard can pick himself to three. Can he do it for five? 
In Bellator, he never really had to go to five, if mm-hmm. I remember correctly. Yeah. Uh, I'm Maybe def- he got Flamenco, but I'm not sure about that. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, it's very rare, I don't think. Has Hector gone four, five full four rounds before? That's what I'm thinking. The only person I think he might have done it against is Alexander Flamenco when uh, Shlomenko was fighting in tournaments because Lombard was the champion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, who knows? I mean, uh, but then it, no matter what, five rounds is always tough. Um, going through it once doesn't prove much. So, uh, But if it is the main event, that still makes one hell of a fight. Uh, three rounds or five, doesn't matter. I'm excited for it. Yeah, I mean, regardless, I still give the advantage to uh, the Lombard net anyway. Mm-hmm. Shlomenko was a decision, and that's, from what I can see, is only five round. Yeah, it's only his, five, his only five round fight in the states was against Shlomenko, and he won that fight, obviously. Mm-hmm. By the way, uh, and now we're gonna talk about you know as far as grappling goes. We've been going doing this uh, submission grappling tournament now on the page for some time now. Uh, about we've gotten through the first sixteen matchups, so. Now we finally go on to the uh, secondary round of, of matchups, and then we did the first one a couple days ago. Minotaro Nogueira versus Uriah Faber. If you have, if you don't know who won that, you didn't just not paying attention. <laughs> that was pretty big blowout. Um, <laughs> I thought it should be. I think. Yeah, I mean, I was surprised. I thought you know some people would give it to Faber. I think you only got like maybe three votes. This is insane. Um, Let's go through the rest of these matchups, though, just kind of quickly, you know, just to give fans a general idea of, of what our picks are, at least. Um, Genke Sudo versus Damian Maya coming out later on today. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, we were talking about this a little bit before we went live. Um, yes. I mean, I love Sudo. I love his style. It, <sighs> he's the most unused grappler uh, you can find in the Mecca, but if you want to look at Damian Maya. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's my personal favorite out of that side of him and Jackery. It's just, it, it's tough to pick Maya over Sudo. Yeah, I mean, Sudo's back in the day was always known for those wicked, wacky submissions and strikes that he'd go for. And he uh, jumped from mount to triangle. I've still never seen anyone else do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, you mean Maya? No, no, actually, Sudo. He jumped from full guard to triangle. On top, he'd be on top in the guy's guard, and he'd jump to a triangle. He'd jump mount triangle and finish him. It's the craziest thing if you've never seen it. Who did he do that to? Uh, a couple of grappling tournaments. I don't know the guy. Oh, I saw highlights of it, but dude, I, I mean, gotta look that up. That sounds yeah, insane. It's, it's pretty damn nuts. I mean, it's, like I said, he it's, like I said, he'd freaking do the low bot in the middle of the ring. He'd start moonwalking. <laughs> against Mike Brown, he was doing like a freaking karate kata. His back was to Mike Brown. He's still doing the thing. And Mike Brown's like, I have no idea what the hell you're doing, dude. Yeah, uh, that's well, insane. Like, yeah, I mean, Sudo as an overall fighter is very, very, very complex one indeed. Uh, as a submission grappler where this tournament really resides, yeah, that's the hard thing is, is to, to, root, to go against who he's matched up here with, which is Damian Maya, who uh, by a large margin defeated Frank Shamrock here in the first round. Um <laughs> Uh, that's a, that, that's all, I, as far as who I go for, obviously it's Maya, the guy has better credentials, not only in MMA, but outside of it, especially, and especially because of outside, that guy used to just grapple with heavyweights, guys like Gonzaga, he's also done it with Verdum, done, and is, and was successful against Gonzaga, um, actually tapped him out in, in a grappling tournament, so, I mean, um, as far as who wins that one, I gotta go with Maya. Sudo is always gonna be one of those like a crazy, accomplished, exciting fighters. And um, man, when did he stop fighting? Now that I think, uh, I think he retired in two thousand five after beating Demacio Page. It's either him or Ramon Dacker. one of the two. It was a shocking retirement. He brought it out of nowhere. Yeah, I mean, man, man, that guy uh, makes me I'm miss gonna- him. John Jones, by the way, I was kind of worried that John Jones had jumped, but he. I, I have faith in our fans. I've been saying it this whole time. That, I mean, there's <laughs> yeah, some. Yeah. Man, I mean, throughout the first 16 matchups, I was scared, uh, but you guys held held my faith high, and didn't get too many messed up. Yeah, I mean, looking at it all, there's none of them that I can like think is really like a wrong pick. They all made 
you know, some I, I, I vote the other way, but I, I, I wouldn't complain with any guy that made it to the second round. Yeah, I mean, all 30, like I say, man, whenever I make these, I try to put in guys who deserve to be there, who have had good careers, great careers, because of the style of submission grappling that they possess. And uh, I think all 32 of these guys definitely have earned a spot here. So, you know, whoever made it to the second round, I would have been totally fine with. And I am. And, you know, uh, yeah. I, but I, I did feel Genke Sudo deserved to beat John Jones. I did think that possibly uh, if John Jones won, then no way does he beat Damian Maya. In my opinion, as far as grappling, he's still a white belt, according to himself. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Um it, it, so I'm excited uh, more so to see how far Damian Maya gets because uh, as far as the rest of this tournament, think about that. He beats Sudo. He has to go against uh, Minotaro Nogueira. Think and about that. That's, that's obviously something we'll talk about for another time. Yeah, but. I just thought I'd think of that. Just like, ugh, I don't know why. I mean, this is like a fake tournament, but it's fun to, to talk about. Well, that's the about. whole point. It's just fun to think about, you know, let's say, like, I mean, like, it, it also has to do with how people are approaching this. Are you approaching it from their ability to submit their opponent, their ability to grapple their opponent, their overall career as a grappler, you know, how that helped them in their career? Yeah. But how are you going to approach this tournament? Exactly. That's why, you know, many people call other people idiots and stuff whenever they vote for other people. There's really no wrong way to vote unless you're just like basing it on something idiotic such as you know you know oh well they had tougher competition throughout their career in in some aspects i think that's a dumb reason um i mean if they were able to show that they were accomplished grapplers and submit guys left and right you know it's kind of it's kind of unfair to to base it on that in my opinion i mean i guess in certain circumstances it makes sense but it's also unfair to base it off of their actual grappling career it, this is about solely their MMA career yeah, that's somewhat of a, I wouldn't say prejudicial kind of thing, but that has nothing to do with why I put them here. Mm -hmm. um, not because of their grappling credentials. There would have been other different uh, fighters I'd have put on here if it, if if they were, you know, um, and you probably wouldn't have heard all about the majority of them. You know what I mean? There are a lot of uh, fighters that fight even today that have better outside MMA grappling credentials than a lot of these guys. But they, they, they have like one or two MMA fights, but I mean, I yeah. could put because their MMA career wasn't great because of their grappling. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they they or they couldn't even make the transition. These are guys who maybe you know whether or not they were accomplished outside, they can make it happen in the ring. All thirty-two yeah. of these fighters. That's um, the thing about John Jones. They have zero grappling credentials outside of MMA, but he's found a way to be able to mainly with his leverage and his strength lock a limb up or lock a lock a neck up and finish you. Yeah, I mean the only thing he had outside of MMA was wrestling. He wrestled a lot yeah. um, and didn't and like wrestling. A lot of. Like, he doesn't use a lot of highly technical moves. You're not going to see a triangle from him. You're not going to see a leg lock from him. But he uses, like, you know, the key lock, the kimura, the choke. The thing that he can use his wrestling to really get. Yeah, exactly. We'll move on to the next matchup here. Jacare Souza versus Ha 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 Fabrizio Verdum. That's such oh a tough goodness. one. Wow. Oh, oh, my goodness. I gave this no thought, which is wow. The, the better grappler is, is Jacare. Oh, you motherfucker! Yeah. Zachary, the better MMA career grappler. I well, that's might Doom. Have Doom. Yeah, I mean, uh, Doom has done a lot. He's had not only longer of a career, but I mean, look at the guys he submitted. Don't even look at Fedor. Look at everybody else he submitted. <laughs> yeah, he submitted Fedor. He submitted Nogueira. Yeah. Overeem. What else did he submit? He submitted. Uh, I know. Did he? He also submitted Alexander. No. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. This is yeah, not. This is I think like right after the fold of pride or. Yeah. What man? Yeah, he submitted some dudes. He's also you know had quite a career. Uh, he's he's knocked out Gonzaga. Um, well, he's put he, and as of late he's had this amazing resurgence. And in his last fight with Matt Brown, I was just impressed as all fuck. To be honest with you, I, 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 as far as because of you know his influence, because of that aura that he has, because of. Him being a heavyweight, even even I, even that makes me want to give him props. I honestly edge him just slightly over Jacare. Jacare wow. is definitely outside of the UFC without even basing. Uh, if I were to pick him off of that outside of the UFC, he's also one of the craziest credentialed fight uh, grapplers outside of, of of MMA. And in MMA, he taps dudes left and right as well. Um, and that also has to do with how you decide to vote. If you decide to vote for who is a superior MMA grappler. 
you can vote for Jack Craig, and that's the right answer. Yeah, I don't. It's hard to pick a wrong guy in this matchup, man. Yeah, who's, who's had the better career because of grappling? The answer is Verdum. That's you could you could approach you either way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and as far as skill, and as far as maybe aggressiveness, Souza's easily the more aggressive grappler for sure. I think exactly. I think he I, I think he hunts that submission down like it's a fucking like it's chicken with more meat on it like a black dude coming after it. I don't care what you have to say. <laughs> He'll go after it, man. That dude is a beast. Uh, you know, Jack Ray is a much better path for He's much better for on top from what I've seen. Um, I say, like, uh, like you said, his aggressiveness with the submissions. He'll go for him more. Uh, it's a hard one. <laughs> and it's so funny because you didn't give it much thought until you actually looked at it, too. And I was just, whoa, wait, what? Yeah, I, I I was because there's another matchup I was I, I got more excited for because I I guess it, man there's really no wrong answer and I don't know which way the fans are gonna vote for this one I know some yeah. fans have started this tournament off saying Souza should win the whole thing and this that and the other I'm sure there's some Verdum fans that feel that way I mean I I give I I slightly give the edge to Verdum just based off his career because of who he submitted as well because of how successful he is uh, altogether Jacare I mean. Maybe if this was like three years in the future and we saw how far Fabricio could take it to uh, like think like going into the future as far as his title fight with Kane, maybe Souza, if he ever got a shot at a title, maybe three years from now, who knows? That, that answer could be changed in my own mind. Who knows? Um, yeah. But in the now, right now, I just I go I got to go over Verdum, just barely. Because there are some things about Jacare's grappling that are better than Verdum's, in my opinion. Yeah, and you know that, you know, even though there's no real wrong answer, if you don't agree with half our fans, you're idiots. If you don't agree with the other half our fans, you're still idiots. So, <laughs> pretty much, I mean, in this matchup, more than likely goes up against Maya. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, well, a killer matchup. I mean, man, that's just an insane matchup altogether. And then we go with the next matchup here: Matt Hughes versus BJ Penn. That's poor Fucking placement on my uh, part. I feel as far as the randomization of these matchups, but. Matt yeah. Hughes just BJ Penn. I mean, Matt Hughes was always a great submission guy, but <laughs> BJ actually submitted him. So yeah, it, it's the wrestler versus the submission grappler in submission grappling tournament. Uh, BJ has already won between the two of them by submission. BJ is a yeah, much better man. guy. Yeah, back. man. BJ is a better guy on top. You're passing more versatile submission. There's this is really no contest. Yeah, I mean, I mean BJ also. Uh, not only that, but just that that guy had more of a, uh, you know, I mean, think his, with Hughes, he used the, his influence more so was with wrestling, not. But I mean, he was able to adapt in the sense of of grappling and being able to handle you know high level grappler submission artists and oh, became yeah. one himself. Um, that in itself definitely gives him high credentials. But it's like hard not to. But I mean, cause I I don't want to like uh, like even in the wrestling uh, one, I didn't want to base certain fighters wrestling off of, you know, who like if they got matched up with somebody that they beat, you know, like the John Jones Rashad Evans matchup in the wrestler tournament we had. Um, I didn't want. I, I didn't think that was fair to really base you know the the wrestling of John Jones to be better than Rashad's because he won that fight when he didn't utilize any wrestling whatsoever. BJ yeah. Penn, when he fought Matt Hughes, utilized a very effective grappling and actually submitted him. So well, that's that's that the that was, difference there for me. A lot of that also stemmed off of a, he rocked him with a punch on the top. But, I mean, regardless, I mean, not to disrespect Hughes, he's one of the greatest of all time. You won't take it away from him. This is a bad matchup. He's not beating BJ Penn. There's, there's just no way. Yeah, I mean, unless you want to look at the second matchup that Hughes outgrappled BJ in the second round. I mean, he almost got submitted in that in that fight too. If you remember, he almost got tapped out with a late late mid, late second triangle and got saved by the bell. Um, but he was able to find his way on top and then found the crucifix and, and pounded BJ out. I mean, but um, but didn't BJ have like a popped ribs and that's why he gassed so much? And that's that's what they alleged at least. That was before he was really, really? in shape. Too. I heard nothing about that. I didn't know that. Yeah, I think that's why. Like. He looks fresh in the second round. He was grappling with him. It was in the third. It was all of a sudden. I think he had a pop rib and couldn't breathe. But I mean, I don't. I'm, I sound like I sound like a Brazilian. I'm not trying to make excuses. I know. Or anything. What's the matter with you? Who the fuck do you think you are, Junior Dos Santos? Uh, I, I know he's back to sports. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's hard. To, it's hard to really pick Hughes in this matchup. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm almost trying to like pick Hughes, but yeah, it's BJ Penn fine. probably wins. The only reason you have is like, well, BJ from a submission grappling standpoint, aside from takedowns, probably does it all better. Yeah, and it's like looking at Hughes' career, he hasn't submitted anybody of 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 um of merit except George St. Pierre uh, and uh, Ricardo Almeida. Yeah, the Almeida one was really nice. That was that was a I mean that was a strength submission. That's all that was. That yeah, was that was just full wow. muscle. Just get here in my choke, and you're so you're out. You're out, bitch. Yeah, cause you ain't it, getting out. You know, like a. Uh, it looked like he was trying to do like a like an anaconda type grip, and just he like, could have gotten away with that too. But I mean, he he would have needed to lock it in a different way. But I mean, obviously, you know, the strength was there. He just squeezed for dear life, and that that dude was out. And the, the, the GSP submission, I love far side armbar. That was beautiful. That that on top spinner on armbar. Yeah. Was, George's one was great too. Um, the one he built, pulled off on Matt. Oh, the Kimura. The Kimura to armbar switch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, man, <laughs> this is why I love this tournament because I, I yeah, that's why I love talking to you about this tournament because you and me both uh, practice jujitsu. So yeah, I love to do a grab um, Which yeah. by the way, did you hear uh, Pat's out of his fight? Say it again. Pat's out of his fight. Pat who? Pat Curran. Oh fuck! What? Calf injury. Yeah, calf injury. Oh, good I haven't fuck. Played, I'm planning on returning on Friday the gym. If I see him, I'll ask what's up about it. What? Uh, that was this that? Friday's? What? No, I'm going to the gym on Friday. No, but I'm saying, like, w- when was that fight? I don't think it was this Friday. Um, he said he's he said on his Facebook page he's looking for a July return. Um, yeah. Kind of like a conditioning drill. All right. Well, you fucking killed my mood. All right. <sighs> Shit. <laughs> The happy mood as it is anyway, you sure it was bastard. Oh, God damn it. Well, I wonder who gets the spot. Maybe Daniel Strauss? I don't know. Um, Honestly, I think Pitbull would rather wait. I don't think he will. Pitbull doesn't strike me as someone who wants to get another opponent and do an interim title. He wants Pat because he wants Yeah, Pat. fucking interim title. We're going to talk about that, too, with Bellator, by the way. Them and interim titles, those fucks. All right, anyway, yeah, right. we're halfway through this thing. Let's move, let's move forward. Frank Mir versus Hanato Babalu Sabral. That's, I mean, that one's, that one's, uh, 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 <laughs> uh, 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 this is going to but I'm looking for a reason to say Babalu, because I do feel, from a technical grappling standpoint, Babalu's superior. It's just hard to go against Frank Mir in this matchup. Uh, I, I'm going to need you to explain that to me, because I really don't buy that. <laughs> um, as far as why I think is a better technical grappler? Yes. I think he's just tighter, he's more fluid, I think, um... Yeah, I mean, uh, shut up! Don't laugh. I'm oh, not. Oh. I'm not saying shit. I'm listening. It's just been a while. It's been a while since I've seen Bob Blue fight, honestly. So I'm trying. Yeah, to I mean, he's fall. retired now. Um. Yeah, and uh, the, the ones I'm thinking about are like his anaconda, his his, his slick arm bars. Um, didn't he have some kind of like uh? That weird, anaconda weird. choke he put on somebody in, in and, uh, and didn't let it go. That's what ended his UFC career. Yeah, he got. It was at like UFC '87, I believe. In, uh, 74, I think. Oh, um, I'm way off. Fuck, I don't know. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, he put it on some guy, and then the ref was, like, having to yank it off, yank him off and shit. I, I think he was also the first guy to submit Shogun. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, I, uh, I, that, I, think, I think it was that win, too. I mean, you think about that. I mean, he submitted some better guys. I felt like a lot of people were giving, a, giving the, the tournament shit because of the fact that Bob Lou beat Boss, but... I felt that it was a well, fair win. It's 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 a great fighter versus a great grappler. This isn't the fighter tournament. This is a grappler tournament. That's yeah. why I think Bob Lute is the win. Yeah. Um, this isn't a favoritism. People didn't because obviously, if you're gonna pick favorites, Boss wins that. But you know, yeah. that's not what this tournament is about. That's why my faith in the fans are, are, of our page are, are, are still you know still decent. They're going there. Yeah. Yeah. No, they've been there. You know. I mean, you, you thought they were gonna why pick some shitty up? picks. Yeah. Yeah. You went into this all negative. Not negative, just highly skeptical. I'm a Cubs fan. I gotta have that kind of mindset. <laughs> but, uh, oh, you and those fucking Cubs. All right. Anyway, speaking of me or Fedor matchup, that's one that you know. I I thought Fedor. I thought he again the better grappler. That's like that's like the that's like the Suze, that's like the so uh, Jacare Souza Verdun matchup. There really is no wrong answer though the wrong answer would supr- or though the the loser i mean would have surprised you regardless so 
Yeah. Um, you were, I mean, I was so bare like this, and you were able to talk me just barely for going for Fedor. Um, but it wasn't like Frank decisively beat him. I think he only no, beat him by less than 10 no, votes, so. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, it, once again, it, it's hard to go against Mir because where his grappling has taken him versus where Babalu's grappling has taken him. Especially when you look at the fact that, yeah, I mean, Babalu's grappling when he was in the UFC was something something crazy, man. And, and But, I mean, he couldn't. He couldn't beat Chuck. Well, it's not even that, but like he just there was just so many guys of of you know of, of merit that if he had beat him and if he had used his grappling for him, I think there's specific matchups, the Chuck one included, that if he did use his grappling in a certain sense, and won because of it, uh, we could be you know talking about Babalu in that sense. But Frank Mir did. I mean, he won the the heavyweight title that way. He won the you know he beat Brock that way. He beat so many guys with so many different submissions. You look at Mir's record. He, there's, it's, it's, uh, I don't think he has any submission the same as any other fight in his career. I think he's always had it mixed up. I remember writing that when I was doing like a statistical thing for you. Cause when I put the matchups, I'll do like their statistics of their record, their submissions, what's their favorite. Mir doesn't have a favorite. doesn't discriminate at all. That dude does it all. Yeah. And, and it's, um, and it's because of that, that I picked Mir. I mean, he's m much more versatile. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm looking at Babalu's Facebook page, and uh, he <laughs> committed Chael, you know, shocking, well, alarm up. committed Mike Van Arzel, and then obviously with the David Heath one where he didn't go. I, you know, one thing that always bothers me when people talk about the Sylvia armbar, that was a, that was a poor armbar. Oh, fucked. Yeah, he was, like, falling off of that one. I mean... Like the pressure of an armbar to the forearm. It was a very loose arm, but it was a poppy arm, but it won him the fight. Yeah. At the end of the day, that's what mission won him the fight. But <laughs> just, as far as what it's done for his career, Frank Mir's got to win. To be honest, I, I if even if he hadn't gotten that arm bar, it, it was looking like he at some point would have submitted to him anyway. You know what I mean? Yeah, he would have slipped some on. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean. Swung around for a leg lock, and he made up his, it's not just kind of what turned out to be his own submission against, uh, who was it, not Freeman, uh... Williams, where you had that, like, shoulder lock. Yeah, you know? it was like, this <laughs> it was such a weird one That's from the like guard. Yeah, um, from the guard. I was just so impressed watching that one. One of my training partners, Joey Deal, who's uh, got a fight coming up, can't spoil guy except for 51. Uh, he does that submission all the time. He's just so quick and so easy to lock on with someone sleeping on it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. I gotta go, Mir. It has to be done. I can't. Yeah, it's gotta be done. Yeah. Next matchup, and one that I'm excited for. Hicks and Gracie and, and Shinya Aoki. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Fuck. I, th I think this is one where if it was, uh, are you all right? Yeah. I didn't know if he was just face planted on the computer or fell asleep. <laughs> nah. I'm fine. I just put my oh. head down for a sec. No, go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. Well, I just think I, immediately I got... I, I, I'm torn, but for some reason, and I don't have a reason why, I just kind of want to go with Aoki. The reason I'm going Aoki is he's had a, he's had a, a successful, long MMA career. Yeah. If you look about who is the better, this is another one, if it was, who is the better grappler, who's the more influential grappler, it's Hickson, yeah. no doubt. This is MMA grappling. I mean, Hickson was 11-0 against Takata... Against uh, Funaki, or Funaki was his biggest win. I think he'd be like, "Man, kind of hard." Uh, some asshole Japanese guy who no one likes. But uh, <laughs> as far as just an entire career of submission grappling, people don't want to admit it. Aoki's got to be one of the best ever. Really yeah, happy. I mean the dude can do. I mean he's like he's like pseudo, but in way A more aggressive. Pseudo. Huh? He's like a modern pseudo. Yeah, and and he's way more aggressive. He goes after it. That dude can pull flying rubber guards. Fuck you, all right. Yeah. When a guy can pull a, a rubber guard while you're while holding, like, <laughs> I don't know who he is fighting, but I remember watching a fight where he was like trying to pull some flying shit, and the guy caught him basically. So he pulled rubber guard in midair. I was like, what the fuck? This guy was just pulling the, the sickest shit, and he always does. He can pull. 
uh, locks out of nowhere. I mean, the, the guy has kept a consistent basis of submitting the best competition that 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 Japan and basically all of Asia has to offer, especially. And then uh, every now and again, he'll drop the ball when he has to come to America and fight. But well, he's I mean, that, consistently that, that, stayed a dangerous fighter throughout his whole career, as far as submissions go. And there's always that argument of um, traveling east to west is much easier than traveling west to east. A lot of fighters have talked about it, but um, I mean, the thing is, Shinyoki's done his whole career without any kind of striking. His striking sucks. There, there, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. His striking's terrible. Yeah. It's it, it's a looping little soft little dab to get you to think about something else. And then, uh, like him and BJ Penn, are the two best guys with leg flexibility and dexterity. Yeah. They can flip their legs up to any position out of nowhere. From, well, I didn't see that coming. You didn't set it up at all. You just threw your leg over my head and a bar bar. Shit. And yeah. it's, he will catch you out of nowhere with anything. Yeah, and exactly. Hickson is much like all grips. He focuses on the basics, focuses on the fundamentals. Because I think every grappler should. You know, it's all about the basics and the fundamentals. You build off that, you know, later in your career. Um, you know, he's much more of a surprising grappler. He's much more of a... Uh, the grappler, he's much more successful long term than MMA. Uh, when, when I really think about it, it's hard to go against Aoki mm -hmm. in MMA sense. Yeah, now that we're talking about it, I feel comfortable knowing that I picked him just off. Like, I, I didn't have any sense as to why I wanted to pick him. I just, for some reason, thinking of the matchup, moved towards him. Then I, I did Hickson. The fact that you, you were way more familiar with the MMA career of Aoki than you are of Hickson. A lot of Hickson's is not really unrecorded, but it's hard to find. It's not out there. Yeah. I mean, uh, some people don't even know he has. he's had an MMA career. That's yeah, the funny thing. Tyson. And a lot of wonder, are they technically what we consider MMA today? His bogus 404 record that his, his father already said was bullshit. Yeah. Because then he said, well, if you had like 400 uh, according to your criteria, I'd have like a million. Yeah, cause, I mean, I guess he was saying, like, you know, random training and, and uh, judo matches and shit like that. He's like, no, nah, you, know, you want to count your jiu-jitsu record, count your jiu-jitsu And apparently he probably lost someone in there, too. Yeah, I'm sure, but because it just seems, like, so unrealistic to me. But uh, There's always that knock against Dixon that, you know, he was in Pancras, he didn't fight Boss, he didn't fight the Shamrock when he was, um... In pride, he didn't fight Sakuraba, the one guy that everyone wanted Sakuraba to fight. You know, knock out Gracie, knock out Gracie, knock out Gracie, and it's just like, well, where, where's Hickson? He never showed up. Yeah. That was, a, I mean, and speaking of Kazushi Sakuraba, that's the next matchup. Hey. Him, the Gracie Hunter versus Josh Warmaster Barnett, who got, who was able to squeak by somewhat st uh, past. Who did he match up with? I forget. Fuji? Fuji, no. Um, hey, Sakuraba? No, I'm so lousy and um, Barnett. Who didn't match him up with? I'm not looking at. Uh, the Funaki. Oh, Funaki, right? Yeah. Yeah, that that only got 26 votes. That was a not a very fun round, I guess. Wasn't surprised. Uh, yeah. just not because of Barnett, but because a lot of people don't know who Funaki is. Yeah, he's such an old school guy. Mainly yeah. a Pancrase career to the point where not a lot. Not that he watch Pancrase. It's kind of boring compared to him. Oh. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not surprised that Josh Barnett would win. I thought he'd win by a bigger margin. Say that again? I thought, I thought Barnett would win by a bigger margin than he did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was funny because, like, I put up their statistics, and then a lot of people say, well, wow, this Funaki guy actually has a lot more submissions than Barnett. He actually has more submission wins than Barnett has wins, you know? Yeah. And so well, people started voting based on that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Just because I, I let people in on, you know, his career a little, like I did with Barnett. And uh, I guess that got Funaki some votes. Yeah, um, and back in his Pancras days, it, it, he was kind of an innovator with his grappling. I mean, MMA was new, uh, mixed fight, shoot fight, whatever they call it, then was, was a new thing. So he was kind of an innovator as far as how to attack leg locks, how to pass, how to transition into submissions and... You know, he was good at it. He was really good. He, yeah. I mean, he pulled a lot of moves that people didn't know you could do and pulled them out of nowhere. Yeah, there's like these classes in shooting and like shoot fighting now that some guys are actually like 
Well, that's Shudo. Shudo has his own ranking system as, as far yeah, as... Yeah, do you know that Shinya Aoki is a Class A shootist? Yeah, but that's not Pancrase. No, but I'm just saying. Well, yeah, Shudo, it has to do with um, your level of pro, your level of amateur, mm-hmm. what kind of competition should be facing. Like, I had a soccer, I had a also a Class A shootist. I think uh, Kawajiri, I think Hanson are all Class A shootists. A lot of the guys that came from Shudo to Pride are Class A. Yeah, and as far as this matchup, Sakuraba and Barnett, man... Yeah, that part. Oh, no. Catch wrestling. Oh, shit. Yeah, it, it, I like it, that. <laughs> that's really what it comes down to. It's catch wrestling versus catch wrestling. Even more pro wrestling versus catch wrestling. <laughs> so, yeah. He's more of a catch wrestling style. Zach Roberts always been about, you know, pro wrestling is strong. I like, pro wrestling to uh, a real fight. Mm. Uh, I love South Pop. Love Zach Roberts. Don't know who to vote for. Oh, man, I I, I kind of want to go for Sakuraba. I mean, the guy has more significant submission wins. Josh Barnett, while he's always con- kept a consistent basis of submitting fighters, he's never really submitted top dogs, you know, uh, and top about guys. The guy who submitted two races. Yeah, he submitted Rampage Jackson, submitted a, 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 a pride Rampage Jackson, too. I mean, it's debatable whether that one or the one that entered into the UFC was better, but... You know, the fact that he, you know, was able to get in there with Rampage, survive those slams, and, and, and get get down get down and dirty with a guy like that and submit him anyway. Huh? Fight. What happened? Yeah, the, the fight between Rampage and Sakuraba was brutal. Sakuraba yeah. was thrown around the ring. He almost got thrown out of the ring a couple of times. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, he's got him in an arm bar, and Rampage just, like, you know, decides to fling, linger him over the crowd there, which is funny. Um yeah. Yeah. Oh, you have to get a submission. I'm gonna pick up and slam you. Oh, it's still. Let me do it four more times. You'll give up eventually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, Sakuraba has always been some tough motherfucker, man. And so, just based on that, based on his his, his submission wins, uh, his career in general, I, I gotta go with Sakuraba. I mean, Barnett, uh, though he was the UFC champ, you know, uh, though he's beaten some big names, not all of them were by submission, and and he never submitted the the better, you know, the yeah, the, the real the, submission names, you know? Who is his best submission win? I know, I mean, Alexander Valianenko, I don't think he submitted Yoshida. Um, he submitted uh, guys who are mostly strikers, to be honest, like Mighty Mo and Gilbert Ivel and and, and, and and one of the Overeem brothers, I believe, uh, Valentin. Um, yeah, I think I remember that. Um, man, he's another one where after he got booted from the USC, a lot of his fights happened in the... Uh, I kind of reaped the pan craze, and those weren't available on, on USB TV. Yeah, and but Barnett is a smart fucking dude. I mean, you ever see that guy? You know, do it like uh, like teach. St- I mean, he, there's been segments where that guy teaches certain things, and he, he knows his way around some shit. You know, it's definitely impressive what the guy knows. But just based on the career Sakuraba's had, who he's fought, who he's beaten, who he's submitted, yeah, you gotta go. You gotta fucking go for uh, Sakuraba. I mean, and yeah. that was why I picked him over Ronda. Mm-hmm. It may, may, I mean, and to know, it's not a Ronda's fault. She's only had only, like, nine fights. Yeah. It's hard to go against the Gracie Hunter, who started in 1996. Yeah. And has had a, like, a 15-year career. Yeah. Plus, nobody remembers the fact that, and I just watched this on the Fight Pass the other day, was that he won the UFC Jap- Japan tournament. And, oh, and it was it was the heavyweight tournament. But he lied to them and told them that he was over 200 pounds when he was like 190 something. 183. He's like, yeah, I'm 201. Are yeah, you? how the yeah. fuck do you get away with that? They don't have. They didn't even have scales. Those fuckers. That's well, hilarious. it's Japan. Japan doesn't give a shit about anything. <laughs> they exactly. match up a 183 pound guy. I think uh, wow, who it was against freaking Yarbrough, 600 pounds. That's what's funny. the guy say? The guy who submitted Anderson Silva. I think that's who it was. <sighs> that's insane. But yeah, I gotta go with Sakuraba. Last matchup here: Jake Shields, Nick Diaz. <laughs> it's going weird. Yeah, I gotta go with Nick right off the bat. I just think uh, he. I mean, let's say this right now: Jake Shields is definitely better at controlling guys. He's the better wrestler. He's the better, uh, you know, guy on top, especially. And um, this is why I wanted to make sure it was called the Submission Grappling Tournament. So maybe you get other styles like Fedor Sambo, Bonas Kachas. But, I mean, it's not just about submitting. If it's about submitting alone, it's Diaz. The grappling edge, it's not even arguable. I think the grappling edge clearly goes to, to Jake Shields. Mm. I just, man, I don't... 
I mean, that, I mean that's be, not a wrong answer. I just thinking about it that way is definitely you know makes me question my pick. <laughs> I mean, this is also the way I approach the uh, Nate Diaz matchup. Nate Diaz gets most of his striking by uh, it's most of his submissions by his striking. Aoki got all of his submissions by his submission grappling. Yeah, by pulling wicked sh- stunts and shit, by throwing his legs over your face. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> Before he before he fought Mayhem, I think had a but before he fought Dan Henderson had a nine fight undefeated streak. Jake? Yeah, not no. Five. He had like a thirteen or fourteen fight winning streak. It was like an, it was like a nine or eight or nine fight submission streak, submitting uh, Robbie Waller, submitting uh, uh, Paul Daly, submitting um, other people. <laughs> The yeah, names kind of cross you, but in that path, and maybe they weren't submissions, but he beat Carlos Condit, Yushin Okami, guys like that. And, yeah. I mean, the, really, f- the fact that he could do that against certain fighters like that, you know, just shows you how great his grappling is. There, there's no denying. He's not an exciting grappler. As a guy who, you and I are both grapplers, we can appreciate what he does. Yeah. He's boring as fuck. There's no denying it. It's not no. exciting. I mean, it's. I mean, when I'm watching Shields fight, I, yeah, I'm watching him like, oh, it's smart, it's good. It, like when he's when he passes a certain way, or if he's going for a submission, or if he's going for, you know, like in the moment with Hector Lombard where he pulled like a guillotine out of nowhere. I mean, that's the only thing I could appreciate about it because he was getting thrown around. But um, yeah, I mean, he's it's, it's not the most exciting guy in the world. Uh, Diaz is an exciting grappler. Maybe that's why I'm I'm, I'm eager yeah. to pick him. But now that I've heard what you've had to say, my pick does kind of go towards Jake Shields. That'll make Chris happy. Uh, but, yeah, man, I mean, just as far as names, I mean, one of your arguments was that Diaz hadn't submitted anybody of of, um, of, of high, you know, name, caliber. I said but, the majority of his submission wins are all against strikers. Yeah, well, I mean, to me, Max Zachary and Evangelista Santos weren't weren't. Um... Well, Maha is Maha is definitely more of a. Well, Maha back to then he was more of a grappler. He developed into a striker, but um, he submitted to Sakurai, was fat out of shape, didn't give a shit. He was there for a paycheck. Um, oh yeah, hmm. I remember watching that live too. It was late at night and shit. Yeah, Sakurai was lighting him up. Yeah, and until he went to the ground, yeah. And the, the Diaz got that arm bar and stopped right down for a long way. That was the end of my high. He had a tap. Yeah. Uh, and Cyborg, eh, eh. <laughs> much more of a grappler than a striker, but it's... But yeah, like to to like to what you said, I remember Diaz was able to get the striking advantage, put Santos down, got on top, got the arm bar. Yeah. Shields doesn't need to always do that. And the fact that he was able to, I, I mean, another thing that I think about is, man, he out-wrestled for four rounds Dan Henderson. That's insane in itself. A guy that big. Yeah. You know what I mean? And he also, in a way, I guess you can say, out-grappled uh, Tyron Woodley. Um, uh, uh, Yushin Okami back in the, uh, the that one tournament at uh, Rumble of Rock. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, now that I think about it, got to go with Jay Shields. I don't it's not that you gotta go with him. It's just an argument, a, a solid argument could be made either way. Yeah, but hearing that, just thinking about the overall point to this tournament, I gotta, I feel more inclined to pick Jake. Yeah, I think I, I, if push came to shove, I'd probably take him. Yeah, let's do some fan questions and then we'll yep. pop out of here. All right, we got a few good ones. I'm actually excited about these. Um, first question. Uh, did Bellator take a step forward or back as a premier organization after their pay-per-view debut, or are they in the same spot they were in prior? Now, first thought, did you watch the pay-per-view? Yeah. You did? Yeah. Right. Well, I'll I let you go to, first. Uh, I happened to be at a Cubs game that day, so I took the day off. Cubs won, by the way. I'm a lucky child. I'm 2 minutes for Cubs games this year. They've only had, like, nine wins. Um, keep going, then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep on giving me 40 bucks for tickets. But, um... <laughs> I don't really think they took a step forward. I don't think. I think they started taking a step back in general when they they didn't abandon the tournament concept, but they abandoned the point of the tournament concept. Yeah. With immediate rematches for champions and um the non-champion winners getting title or non-tournament winners getting title fights, it's just like that's not the point. That's not why you have the tournament title. 
their original tagline was title shots are earned, not given. They're being given now. Yeah. And that's what I think. And and, and 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 like there's a topic in here that talks about the, the, the title implications now at lightweight and middleweight and all and all this stuff and we'll get into that. Yeah. Um, but I already explained this in the last podcast, and so I will say this. I think that they did show, in my opinion, in my eyes, and I don't feel like the majority feels this way because they don't pay attention to it in, in the aspect, in the way that I am. But they showed me that they can build stars. Brooks is that example, the guy that beat Michael Chandler. Yeah. Chandler was an example back in the day. I mean, matter of fact, you know, the year Chandler upset Alvarez, that was in 2011. Um, the way he upset Alvarez like he did, that was the year Brooks debuted in MMA, period. Yeah. Bellator, to me, is showing that they can produce stars, you know, but, um, I mean, you know, you made a point prior to the event, and it was that, because of that fact that this organization isn't, it isn't the UFC, that's what's hurting them. Um, yeah. the, the mean, fact that many fighters aren't happy with Bellator as well, you know, fighters like Brooks, King Mo, Paul Daly, Eddie Alvarez, Pitbull, Ben Askren got screwed. You know, that and the fact that even some of those fighters just been screwed by the organization itself has, hurts Bellator's image in, in general, not only the, despite the fact that these title shots are now getting thrown around, but after watching the event, I do want to see these guys succeed. They are talented. They're great fighters. They are. They they, they back up uh, what they say when they say that they are great fighters. You know, because well, of the fact that they're not in the UFC doesn't mean they're not they, good. Go ahead. They sorry. They have to be in Bellator. I mean, the the whole the old Dana White quote is UFC fighters fight the best fighters in the UFC because the best fighters are UFC fighters. There's great fighters all over the world. Kaladov in Russia should be in the UFC and be a top five guy. Um, Chandler Alvarez come over. They be top five, but the top ten. Um, Pat Curran, top five. Um, Fuck, I wish. Yeah, he, I mean, he really would be. Shomenko, people are taking too much away from his loss at a higher weight class. That doesn't, people are like, the middleweight division's dead because he lost the light heavyweight to a guy who's essentially 30 pounds heavier than him. No, the middleweight yeah, division's dead. And we'll get dead. into that, too, later. Um, but I, from where they stood before the pay-per-view and where they stood after the pay-per-view, for a, a $40 pay-per-view... Uh, much cheaper than what the UFC puts out. It it was a good card. It, it was, was a good card, an entertaining card. I I can see people making an argument for the fact that Brooks and Chandler should have been a draw. I can't see an argument for why King Mo should have won. Um, for that, la- what, say that last thing. I can't see an argument for why King Mo should have won. Rampage won that fight. Hmm. Because I mean. Daniel Cormier said, this is MMA, it's not boxing, kickboxing. Well, this is MMA, it's not top control of the sport. What, did King, what, what is the only thing King Mo did? Took him down, controlled him. Didn't land any punches, Rampage got back up every time. Rampage is the aggressor in striking, Rampage is the aggressor in uh, octagon control. Rampage or cage control, whatever, fuck or cage control, whatever the fuck it is. Rampage is also the aggressor in aggression, which is a, a redundant statement. But, you can, I mean... If you think about it as an MMA fight, judging as an MMA fight, not just a top control fight, Rampage won. Yeah, I mean, he he got back up. He didn't have as much time and didn't control for as long as King Mo did, but he did more damage. And that and that was, if you listen to the last podcast, five fans, that that was my argument for why Rampage could have won. It was a close fight. It wasn't a robbery in my eyes. It was just no, a very it, close fight. Think about what the judging got to. It's not how good your grappling is. It's how effective your grappling is. If you get the guy, down, if you get the guy down and don't do a damn thing, that's not effective grappling. Yeah. It's like if you throw. That's eight just punches, showing you're strong. <laughs> yeah, if you throw eight punches, one of them land. That's not effective kicking. Yeah, it's not effective ground and pound. It's not effective anything. Shouldn't get you the points yeah, as yeah. much as the takedown may have gotten you points. It yeah, shows that you can it. dictate the pace, not yeah. win the fight. Down. That, that's cool. Don't reward her for sitting in guard and the kidney shot every thirty seconds. No, that's, that's not what this is about. Yeah. Next question here. Um, did the Bellator pay per view delegitimize some of the top fighters, such as Chandler losing to Brooks and Alexander losing to Tito? Well, I, I, let me answer first. Uh, Bellator, they shouldn't. Bellator itself shouldn't look at it that way. They should look at it like, hey, you know, we have a new star to build off of. You know, maybe make a rematch. Maybe make Brooks defend the title. Chandler will still be a star. He's, you know, and you can still build him up. And now you can with Brooks also. So now you have another fighter to build up off of. 
by telling the world, hey, we have stars too. We put these best, the best fighters in the world out there, and Brooks can be one of those. You know, that I feel works out for everybody except maybe Chandler because, I mean, hey, he lost. Tough shit. But now that Ortiz has a win, Bellator has something that they can do with Ortiz now. And Blaze and I discussed the possibilities in the last podcast, but now... They have work to do with Shlomenko, you know. They need to keep Alexander in the public eye. And to me, and to me you know, if he stays dominant at 185, I'm pretty sure fans will probably forget. We don't we don't have the longest-term memory unless, you know, you're you're quite the hardcore fan like some of us are. Um, but I don't take anything away from Tito, and I don't take anything away from Shlomenko. He, he, so what, he was the smaller guy. He lost. Tito, you know, I mean, he didn't look too hot into that fight. I mean, that submission was kind of slow. But um, you know he got he got him to the ground, out muscled him, put the submission on him. So it, it was so what? I mean, it helps Tito because you could put him in a match. He can market him. He can market that fight. Whoever he fights next, um, and Alexander Schmenko, if he keeps winning at 185, fans are just gonna forget about it. It's and and he is a great fighter. I feel so. I mean, it, um, I, I see. I, I don't see anybody getting delegitimized here. I got two questions. What's up? Did Ben Henderson get delegitimized when he lost the title and had a really tough fight against Josh Thompson? Well, I mean, when you look at the fact that the guy has the worst luck with decisions and the fact that he wins ones, that people don't think he should win. But do those do, do his loss to Pettis and, and his tough fight with Thompson make him like, well, he's not a top fighter? No. No, he's always going to be a top fighter unless he goes on a losing streak like Maynard did. Why would we? Why would we view Chandler any different for losing one fight against a guy who's proven now that he's won a tournament and he beat Michael Chandler? I don't care what you say. Beating Michael Chandler is a big thing. Yeah. Maybe Will Brooks can just hang. Maybe he can hang with the big guys. And maybe Michael Chandler is a big guy that you know some people feel he didn't really lose that fight. Some people make an argument for a draw. And that's so the, and it, it was shellacking. Mm-mm. That, those were great fights. They were. And Brooks put on an impressive performance as well. And not only that, you know, Bellator now has more fight. That's the best thing about the fact that Bellator has these tournaments for. It really shows you who some of these top guys are that can keep a consistent streak going. Can- it gives guys a chance that wouldn't otherwise have a chance. That's what. That's why I wish Bellator would stick to You win a tournament, you get a title shot. Yeah. That's, that's the best way to build up a star, especially for an organization that doesn't have the ability to market as well as the UFC and doesn't have the press the UFC does. What's the best way to do it? Get him out there, have him fight. Yeah, exactly. Like if if Douglas Lima can go on a run at, at Walter White, he'll become a name too. People will be talking about him. Yeah. If you know, people were talking about Shlomenko because of his impressive streak at, at middleweight. Uh, Lombard got a huge contract because of his impressive Bellator streak at middleweight. Exactly. I mean, and how they do it in the cage from being their shot and. Doing it in the cage. Yeah, I think all of these guys are, are top names. Chandler Brooks, Alexander, Tito's making making his way back into the MMA world now. We'll see how he does. Uh, who he fights next? Uh, if you wanna, uh, if for for fans that think who want to know my opinion on that, go back and listen to the last podcast, number eight. Uh, we go to the next question and kind of goes ties in to what we've been talking about with Bjorn saying that Alvarez. Um, could demand a tr- uh, trilogy fight with uh, Michael Chandler. Doesn't that devalue the interim title that Will Brooks earned? Yeah, that's just stupid. I mean, I know that Bellator wants to make that trilogy fight happen, uh, but yes, it kind of devalues your interim championship and also devalues Will Brooks. Will even commented on uh, Born, Bjorn uh, stating that and, and is pissed off as well, as he should be. You know, this is just another... Uh, thing about Bellator, it really pisses me off. You know, they, they, they do this bullshit to their fighters. Alvarez versus Brooks needs to happen next. Give yeah. Michael a fight, and if he wins, then give him a winner of Brooks and Alvarez, if you're not going to put him in the tournament. But either way, you get a rematch. So, I mean, one that's sellable, especially, because I don't, you know, especially if they could pull their heads out of their asses and get behind their fighters like, like Brooks. Uh, so, I mean... If Alvarez had the option, I would wish for him to just leave and go to the UFC. But with this being Bellator, I'm sure they're going to make Alvarez get that last fight in one way or another. So, uh, I mean, does it devalue the interim title? No, because the interim title has no value. Does it devalue <laughs> Will Brooks? Yeah. It, uh, like, when you said it, it devalues the title and Will Brooks, I feel like it does devalue the title because the interim title is a glorified number one contender. Yeah. It devalues Will Brooks because that's his... his He's now 
it, he's known because of he won this interim championship fight. Eddie Alvarez kind of also decided before the fight by saying that the two of them are fighting for a paid fight, which they really are. What does the interim title mean? Nothing. You're not a champion. Eddie Alvarez is a champion. Um, they, they, they need to make, unless it's something contractual with Eddie Alvarez, which you have to wonder what I mean. I think that Eddie Alvarez being on a pay per view might have been contractual, honestly. That's why they keep trying it. Um, because they have to be able to match the fact that UFC can put him on a pay per view. Yeah. So I think that has to do with why they keep trying to put him on a pay per view. And also, Chandler Alvarez 3, let's face it, sells better than, and, than uh, Alvarez Bro. At least right now. There's a fan on the page too that actually messaged us with an idea stating that you know what the what Bellator should do is go back to their tournament styles and then like have every every once a season or so do a pay per view with all the winners getting like you know all the finals of each tournament being on that one pay per view and there being a couple championship fights on it. That actually sounds like a great idea. That would that would be a hell of a way to do a pay per view. Oh, yeah, exactly. Man. Get all your finalists on. Get some title fights in. Yeah. Why not? Have fight on the pay per view, or two tournament championships on the pay per view. Have two of the tournament winners fight champions on the pay per view, and have a super fight to lead it off, or yeah. super break up the tournament fights and the championship fights. Exactly. That isn't like a bad idea at all. No, it's um, not. The thing is, they haven't really gone. I mean, they still do the tournaments. That's still Bellator's draw. Draw is that you know, we always do our tournaments. We always have weekly shows. You know, seasonal, if you will. But their tournaments are becoming like four man tournaments and. Yeah, and they're doing that because you know what they're doing. They did that with the light heavyweight tournament just to make the Kimo Jackson face. fight happen. You know? Yeah, that, that, they did that solely to make. I mean, I mean, Pride did it too when Pride gave Vandalay Silva clearly an easier road than any other guy in the tournament. Same thing with Pro Cap and LK. But, I mean, in the beginning, Bellator didn't do any favorable tournaments. He had a tough match with the first fight on. Exactly. And yet, you had to win three fights to win the championship title match, so to win the title fight. Exactly. And that, to me, is what made the stars of today. Chandler did it, and Chandler's one of the baddest dudes you ever heard of. You know, Eddie yeah. did it. Um, Eddie did it. Lombard did it. Shomenko did it. Curran did it. Every champion they have now did it. Exactly. I don't want them to lose lose out on that, and especially if Jackson fights Newton, but I don't think they will since they're training partners. Or not training <laughs> partners. They have the same manager. They kind of should. I mean, Rampage technically won a late heavyweight tournament. He's next in line for a title shot. Yeah, and Bjorn's now stating he ain't going to force the issue. That's ridiculous. Why not? You don't dick Ryder Rebbe to take uh, King Mo's words. I think he's I think he's so like enamored by being UFC's competition that he's trying to make himself the UFC. And that's going to kill you. That and is. Company is trying be to be a it's because of the fact that they're not the UFC. That's what makes us want to watch them. It's something different. You, sometimes you get tired of the UFC. I did yeah, Exactly. I don't need to. I don't need to, that, Don't make yourself the UFC. You'll screw yourself. You know. Not, I mean, there's nothing wrong with doing pay-per-views. You're, it, the pay-per-view show, it was fine. I enjoyed it. It was fun. Yeah. It was a great card. It had great moments. Um, but yeah, I actually like this, the idea that this fan, I'll find out his name too and I'll message him back and, and give him a, give him a tag in because, I mean, I that, mean, that's a great think, idea. Think about every company that tried to go head to head with the UFC. Pride was the only one that was successful and in the end it failed. Strikeforce failed. Affliction failed. Bellator hasn't failed yet. I don't want to say they're floundering either, but their popularity isn't where it was three years ago. No, and that's not even, that's not the fighter's fault. That's the promotion and their dumbass antics. Yeah, and maybe not popularity, but public image is definitely on. That's it. it. Yeah, we'll go on to the next question here. Which is a better fight, and uh, Eddie Alvarez Chandler three, or Alvarez Brooks? I mean, it depends on how you interpret that question. I mean, what's the better fight to watch? Who doesn't want to see Eddie Alvarez and Michael Chandler fight? But right now, it doesn't make sense. I mean, if Brooks has the interim title, which I mean to you it has no value, but to me, I still I want there to be some value to it. Give Alvarez, uh, Will Brooks, put it on top of a card. Hell, if you want, if you can get a certain amount of fighters on, maybe you get Chandler a fight, make him the co-main. Uh, other title fights, maybe Ortiz, you can make another pay-per-view out of it or something. But I mean, Will Brooks. I feel if he does have that interim title, and according to you, it's just a glorified number one contender, he's still the number one contender. Why not exactly. give him the fight? Exactly. And that's what I was going to say. Like, you know, you feel like the value in the interim belt is you get a title shot. 
Yeah. The West champion just cannot defend his title, and you have to defend your interim title, which I respect fighters who defend their interim title to the point where I do see them as champions because they're putting their, they're technically their title on the line, and if they can defend that against the guy who should be fighting the champion, that's as good as being the champion, in my opinion, especially if the champ, like, Burrell, when he was doing it with the crews, um, the interim title in the heavyweight division before when Couture was out had legitimacy because it was being com- contested as a title. Mm-hmm. The interim title that Carlos Condit won, he said, "No, I'm not defending it. What the fuck's the point? Just give him. Don't give him a. Don't give him a fake belt. Make sure say he's the number one contender, but he's on the sideline. Have other people fight out like you normally did. What's, there's no difference other than marketing. All it is, is marketing. Yeah, and honestly, it, it, for me, Alvarez Chandler is kind of seems hard to market that fight. I mean, I guess we haven't gotten the fans' thought on this, so I'm sure I'll, I'll probably make a post giving my own opinion and seeing what fans think, but uh, what I, I want to see is Brooks. I want them to respect the new blood coming up here. I mean, that's not to say that Chandler is old blood or anything, but Brooks is in the now position, is now in a position that, you know, Chandler was in in 2011 when he defeated Alvarez the first time, and Alvarez versus Brooks could turn out to be an awesome fight. Alvarez is, is rarely ever in a boring fight as it is. So. That's exactly what I was going to say. From Dream to Bodog to now, Alvarez makes fights exciting. You can make a fight with Will Brooks exciting. Maybe he blows Will Brooks out of the water in the first round. That could happen. Maybe Will Brooks blows Alvarez out of the water in the first round and surprises everyone. That, how does he know? We let him fight. Let him fight. He's earned that fight. Let him have that fight. I don't. Well, you know, if, if you want to be respected as an organization, the money will come with the more respect you have. So throw the throw the, the, the trilogy on the back where the guy who deserves the fight his fight. This is the exact thing you built your company upon. Mm-hmm. Don't waver from it. You never know. And I mean, you got to have faith in Chandler. Chandler's an amazing fighter. They can get themselves back into this position someday. And when it does, we'll all be salivating for it. You just don't, mm-hmm. don't do it now when right now it just doesn't feel like the right time for me. Yeah, and let's say uh, Will Brooks defeats Alvarez and maybe defends it against uh, another tournament winner. And Chandler's on a roll. Maybe he wins a tournament. Will Brooks, Chandler, too. You still have a great fight. Another rematch, great fight to be made. Yeah. I mean, you can't go wrong. Belts are just needs to get their head out of their ass and start getting behind their fighters. Get behind Will Brooks. It needs to happen. Next question. What is what is your opinion on showboating, such as Anderson Silva's antics, Nick Diaz, and most recently Michael Page? Well, Michael Page is kind of weird, but uh, if, you did, if you saw Michael Page's fight, he was pulling some weird antics. For me... I think it just depends on the fighter's style. I mean, Nick Diaz uses it effectively in his style. That guy moves forward and just taunts you and makes you make mistakes. Same with the, I mean, hell, Muhammad Ali, if you think about that, he used it awesomely throughout his career. If you're just showboating the showboat, you have no other reason for doing it, and you probably shouldn't do it. But if it does help you in a fight, um, then all power to you. I mean, guys like Nick Diaz, guys like Anderson Silva, guys like Muhammad Ali, those guys used it effectively because it got in their opponents' heads. It got their opponents to make mistakes, to think things differently, to not go through, f- forward with their game plan all the time. That's the point of sometimes showboating. And, and, and if you mean showboating, it's like taunting, you know, stuff like that. Guys like those used it effectively. Did Michael Page use it effectively? I don't know, but, he, you know, w- w- whatever you want to say about it. But I, I just think that showboating, depending on the fighter's style, definitely uh, should answer that question. I mean, show, showboating... That, like I said, that may not be the right word. We're, we're, we're going to run with it anyway. Uh, showboating, if it wasn't for showboating, Ali wouldn't be as memorable. Diaz wouldn't be as memorable. Silva wouldn't be as memorable. Their careers wouldn't be viewed the same way. Mm-hmm. It, here's my stance on that. If it works, do it. If you get knocked out from showboating too much, yes, your own fault. Yeah, that's why Silva didn't do a fucking thing that second matchup with Weidman. You know I mean, he knew that wasn't going to work on him. So why do like, it? You know, it's he, like with any style. You're gonna, you want to strike with a striker? Maybe you knock him out. Maybe knock you out. You knock him out. Job. You get knocked with a striker. Maybe you knock him out. Maybe knock you out. You knock him out. Job. You get knocked out. You've done it. It's it's just, it's, it's it's a way to afford fighting. Oh, I see. Exactly. It. Next question: If Hen if Henderson beats Cormier, do you realistically see him getting a title shot? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I, I think it's only fair. It's been said that the winner of this fight gets promised a world title shot. I mean, I'm sure if the UFC is, I'm sure that they're banking on DC winning the, the, uh, the, this and, and facing the winner of Gustafson Jones. 
But I am aware that fans wouldn't see that Dan would be as deserving if he won than if DC would win. So, I mean, if the UFC already said said it, I'd like to see them keep their word. And as a fan, I'd love to see Dan get a title shot. I'm a big fan of his. But does he deserve it as much if he won than if DC wins? Probably not. So, but, I mean, if, if the UFC has already promised it, why not just give it to him? I mean, my initial thought was it's, it's more of a lifetime achievement award than thing. As far as, you know, the career of Ben Anderson has earned him that title shot. Whereas, had another fighter beaten, knocked out Shotgun and beaten DC, would, like, if that was a, a debuting fighter knocking out Shotgun and beating DC, would he get a title shot? Probably not. You could also make the argument that other than the Vitor Belfort knockout, which was horrendous, some be, a lot of people think he beat Rashida. A good number of people think he beat Rashida Evans. He could be four out of the five right now. And mm-hmm. in, in both those points, I don't want to think he looked good, but he didn't look bad, and he looked like he could have, he looked like he could still hang. The he did not look good in the Shogun fight, but he won. At the end of the day, the win is all that matters. Mm-hmm. Um, Especially if he can get the finish. Yeah, and that's that's the danger with Dan Anderson. Do I think he beats John Jones? Absolutely, one hundred percent. No, I would not put my money on Dan Anderson in any situation. He could still do it, and I would love to eat my word. I would love to eat my word. I just don't see it happen. Yeah, exactly. He's got he's got two pieces of dynamite in both of his fists. The left hand on Van Der the right hand on every other motherfucker he's fought. <laughs> does, does he deserve it? I don't know. I mean, I would it, say maybe one more fight after this. But if he if he does it to DC, it's fucking DC. As far as their rankings go, they have him at number three or something like yeah, that. Yeah, two or three. Especially if he finishes them. Um, oh God, and that's probably the only way he can beat DC. I feel. I'm not gonna not wrestle Dan Cormier now. No, he, he so. looked really good at two hundred five physique wise. Um, exactly. Whereas yeah. Dan is very soft at two hundred five physique wise. Did but, you hear? Did you hear what Dan Henderson did at the? Uh, like these, uh, like these open workout things. No. In his space, he had somebody bring some like uh, some KFC to fuck with DC, <laughs> just to because because or no Popeyes because that's that's DC's favorite fast food is Popeyes and so he had somebody bring it out, and and it, it just to distract DC and it was funny because it was making him jealous and shit. It was, that's funny. I know he had to, I know he had to eat more to chub up to make the minimum weight requirement for the Fedor fight. Yeah, uh, that's funny. And I'm sure Hendo rarely ever... I mean, the guy can make 185, so I mean, the guy probably barely ever has problems making 205. When he was younger in Pride, he would weigh 199 for a... Well, like, when he knocked out Vandal, he was 199.5 pounds. Ah, <laughs> shit. He's never really been a true light heavyweight, but he's made a career of it. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's mainly because of Dan Anderson, it's kind of hard to him that shot. Yeah. We'll go on. This is the very last question, Adam, and I like it. I think this is a good question here. How do you think rules and other things such as enforcement of rules should be handled by judges? Kind of fucked up the writing here, but um, and other things such as enforcement of rules should be handled by uh, judges and referees, such as eye pokes, knees to a downed opponent, and they go out or groin shots, etc. Well, I'll give my opinion real quick. I, I feel I've, this is how I feel. Plain and simple. I feel that there should, you know, be like a one strike policy on everything, I think. If you poke someone in the eye, you get a warning. If you do it again, you get a point taken away. If you the same for a groin shot. You do it once, warning, do it again, point. Now, with knees to a downed opponent, and, and I only agree with when they're down is like if their knee is on the ground. Um, but I think that if you do that and your opponent goes out, no contest. But say the fighter doesn't go out and they continue to go and that happens. I think make it a DQ because you shouldn't be doing that shit twice. Yeah. Um, this is actually one of the questions I asked John Jones at the UFC on Fox 6 uh, Q&A. I asked him, what rule do you want to move over from Pride? He wants knees to the head, except from Turtle because you can get too much leverage. I'm cool with knees to the head from side control, either Turtle side control or regular side control. Um, north south is a little dangerous, but I'd be okay with that. From turtle, you're too you're too risking the back of the head. But I do think knees of the head to any ground opponent sh- should be allowed. Um, I mean, sure it's dangerous, but if it's allowed, fighters learn to defend it. No one got seriously hurt and pride from it. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it makes 
a wrestling heavy fighter have many more options. I yeah, mean, makes one more exciting of fights too. And one, of, yeah, well, like Mark Coleman, for the early wrestlers, his big success in the UFC early on was headbutts. Took that away, moved to pride. His big success was knees from north south. That's how he started to win the championship. Um, how he uh, beat Inoue and won a couple of them. Yeah, and he fucking walked to the ropes. Love that shit. I also want to be judged as or to be the whole. I think it should be done that way. Say that I again. Don't, don't, you can't. Uh, to be judged as a whole. Pride way. Yeah, because yeah, I don't like the idea of you can absolutely demolish the shit out of one guy for five minutes, but if you slightly lose two other five minute time periods that are unrelated to the first, you lose the whole fight. Yeah. I don't like that. If you win the fight, you win the fight. If you win a five minute time period, you, if you win two five minute time periods, that doesn't mean you won the fight. Yeah. So that's why, and I like. That's one of the big things about the um, the Hendrix GSP fight, the Gustafson Jones fight. Is I think that Gustafson won the fight. I think that Hendrix won the fight, but they didn't win the game as far as winning more th- five minute rounds. The goal isn't win the fight; it's to win more five minute intervals, not the fight. That's how the rules set up now. As far as illegal actions. Um, once again, I think Pride does right. I wouldn't take money out of the guy's purse. I think that's that's an old way to do it. I don't like that. But if you're something wrong, yellow card. First yellow card is a warning. But it, it has to be issued any time a rule infraction happens. Second time is a one-point deduction. Third time is a DQ. Yeah, I like that. It is for that's any That's basically what I said, yeah. I mean, I like that. When the guy wants one, you kick him in the nuts, that's a second rule infraction, you still get a you still get a point deduction. Because, I mean, and if you're still not watching until then, you've got to get to you because you're not fighting safe. You're not fighting with the safety of the fighter in mind. So that's my answer to that. I want knees allowed. It, maybe from total it could be an exception because of risk to the back of the head, risk of final complaint. Um, fight to be judged as a whole because it's a fight. It's, 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 it's a sport, but it's a fight. It's not a five-minute contest, a five-minute fight. It's one fight. And I want a uh, warning system similar to the yellow card system. Yellow card system. Yeah, I mean, they'd probably never bring that, but, I mean, they could implement it into the athletic commissions. and. I mean, it may not have to be like this. I mean, they could give that kind of enforcement to the refs, you know what I mean? Well, the refs have that enforcement. They just don't use it. I feel like that's why... Exactly, have... yeah, that's kind of the point of the question, I feel, is like, you know, and these if refs... Like a, if they have a physical object like the yellow card, they know they can whip out. <laughs> they makes a clear sign to the fans. It makes a clear sign to the. They're not going to. They're not going to whip out their dicks. I mean, like, <laughs> <laughs> so if, if it's going to be a clear sign to the fans, fighters, they know uh, what that's going on. The out. second I laughed, I was scared you were going to take it there. Well, yeah, I have to. It's going to have to get it over anyway. So. Ah uh, shit! But, you think we're going to get sued or something? What? Why? <laughs> Big John McCarthy from you wanting to see his dick whipped out. My bad. He's a, he's a good looking guy. He's got to be packing something. Still, big he just. I guess a big guy. Ah, uh, you fucker. All right, go ahead. Continue. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty much done. I just talked about Big John McCarthy's cock. I can't go anywhere after that. Uh, <laughs> you silly bitch. <laughs> well, I think we got a lot talked about um, as far as the tournament, questions, topics, all the shit going down. This weekend, okay. UFC 173. Um, well, we should probably tr- we should try and get another uh, podcast in and try and try and talk about yeah. that card. Yeah, this weekend. Yeah, if you're down, uh, for anybody else, any other admins are down. I'm gonna try and get get a podcast going just to review that whole card. All right, um, I will. We need to hit you up tomorrow. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. But other than that, great time. Always good talking to you, bro. You're one of the smartest dudes I know, especially uh, about. Say that again. So thanks a lot, you too. Yeah, thanks, man. I mean, it's uh, uh, it's good talking to you. It's good talking about uh, intelligent shit sometimes. Because yeah. this is the sh- this these are the kind of topics that we need to talk about, and and I'm glad that we can. And I need and, and, I, and I definitely, it definitely gives me ideas for to write for the page to get the opinions of our fans because we definitely need to know what they're thinking as well. I know I feel a certain way, and I'd like to see if anybody else does. Just to just to see, and and I made the and go ahead and listen to the podcast. I'm not sure if you heard the last one or not, but fight fans, uh, Adam, if you haven't heard it, go listen to it. As far as just to understand what it is, I plan on doing for the page. As far as Bellator is concerned, um, 
I'm excited to see where Bellator goes from here as long as they can get their head out their asses. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I'm excited to see where, where it goes from here. That pay-per-view honestly did nothing but positive for me. Uh, it got it gets me excited for their fighters. It gets me excited to see where they go from there. Uh, I, I felt that their pay-per-view was a success. And maybe in pay-per-view vibes, probably not. But in the eyes of the people that watched it, I would hope that it, it, it puts a, a more positive light in watching those fights and seeing how it played out and seeing how well, things went. If people didn't really watch it, it's getting people talking about Bellator. That alone is a big thing. That's a victory, yeah. And you, and you never know. And, and now there are certain ideas out there that are being thrown around by fans that can help make it succeed. I like that idea that was thrown to us by that fan. I'm going to find out who he is, let him know that that's a great idea. And, uh, and then we'll probably talk more in depth about it on the next one, man. All right, sounds good, buddy. All right, buddy. F fans, give us comments, feedbacks, concerns, anything you want to hear from us, any other topics you'd like to give us, message them, put them in, in questions. We'll get to, down to it. We're definitely going to be putting out more podcasts out. So give us a listen, spread the word, share it. Appreciate you guys. Bye. Later.